let me tell you first what I'm running against, because it is important. I'm, I'm somebody who's most of my working life in the district and around the country has tried to work for positive gains. And I have stood in opposition to things, but um, I'm more of a solutions-oriented person. That's the nature of my work. That's the nature of farming and trying to figure things out. But always you've got to stand against stuff, too. And my goodness, do we have dark times in which we have to stand against some things. And so I just want to begin with that. So, you know, clearly we have... Uh, we have somebody at the top of the Republican Party, Trump, and we have somebody down here in Southwest Virginia, in Salem, sort of Southwest Virginia, Morgan Griffith, who's right there with them, lockstep on virtually everything. And it seems to me what that what they stand for, kind of across the board, in their words and their actions, is four things: it's arrogance, it's cruelty, it's resentment and rage, cultivating resentment and rage, and just extraordinary levels of dishonesty. They, they stand, they're arrogant in so many ways. First of all, threatening the nuclear annihilation of a country that we don't like, but even if we don't like their leadership, we're talking about millions and millions of human beings, many of whom are probably not that dissimilar from us, and the arrogance of being at the brink of nuclear war, the arrogance of withdrawing from a deal with Iran that perhaps not perfect, but that everybody agrees is working and accomplishing uh, what we want. The arrogance of putting forward a budget in which 80% of the benefits go to the top 1% when the top 1% has been benefiting from most of our budgets and most of our federal policy for the last 40 years and we want to give that same group that already has so much that much more while cutting fundamental services and programs that enable ordinary and working people. That is just incredible levels of arrogance. It's cruelty. It's cruelty when we talk about this Senate bill that was just passed last week with Mike Pence, the Vice President, throwing the deciding vote that overrules an Obama-era rule that was going to allow people to sue the major Wall Street banks and the biggest corporations, enter into class action lawsuits, sounds rather obscure and wonky, but what they've done is they are now forcing all of us, ordinary consumers, to go through forced arbitration when we have a legitimate claim. Most people don't do arbitration because they know the odds are stacked against them, and when we do enter into arbitration, we lose 80% of the time. And yet, this party that supposedly stands with the people is now pushing this forced arbitration. It's cruelty in so many ways, and perhaps represented most extraordinarily by the decision this last week when ICE agents arrested a 10-year-old girl with cerebral palsy who had just completed emergency surgery and be, instead of letting her go home to a grandparent who was a legal citizen in the United States, she is in a detention center funded by our taxpayer dollars, a 10-year-old girl with cerebral palsy. My God, what have we come to? That is such level of cruelty. And it's stoking this resentment and rage. We have it in so many ways. It's against women. It's against people of color. And fundamentally, they have perfected the act of convincing those of us who are struggling to blame it on others who are also struggling. Right. Maybe a little bit more. Turning one group of people that haven't fared so well, aren't doing so great, like a lot of our neighbors in Appalachia, against other people. Yeah. Be they immigrants, people of a different race, LGBT folks. Resentment and rage, that's their stock and trade. And then last, the dishonesty. My goodness. It's from the banal, like claiming the biggest inauguration crowd when they had a paltry showing, <laughs> to really, really important things, like perpetuating and reinvigorating the myth of voter fraud. Yeah. Right after the before and after the election, and now we have an attorney general who's commissioned a group of people that are going to try to prove this myth of voter fraud. It's such dishonesty. It's dishonesty about climate change and ecological problems. And talk about arrogance and dishonesty. Scott Pruitt is the head of the EPA. <clears throat> and it's dishonesty when on the one hand you go before the election and after the election to coal mining country and lie to miners to say that by getting rid of EPA rules, we're going to reinvigorate the coal industry and create thousands of, uh, thousands of jobs. When in coal country, most people know that isn't the case. They lie there while simultaneously trying to cut 
the Appalachian Regional Commission, the Economic Development Administration, Community Development Block Grants, the very federal things that actually can and do make a little difference in creating new jobs and building the new economy. We've got this guy that's so dreadful, that so epitomizes this arrogance, this cruelty, this resentment, misplaced rage and this dishonesty, but he and Jeff Sessions and Scott Pruitt and Betsy DeVos didn't drop out of the sky. They are the culmination of 40 years from the extreme right in changing the way a lot of Americans think about ourselves, our neighbors, our land, and our country. They've built this. They got us where they wanted to get us. Yeah. And maybe they took us a little further than they imagined they would. Mm -hmm. But this is a long-term project, very well funded, covering the media, think tanks, and everything else that has gotten us to this place. And I'll say one other thing that's gotten us to this place, and this is maybe my single biggest motivation for running, is because we, the Democrats, as the alternative, have not done a good enough job. We have not been strong enough. We have not presented clear enough alternatives. Right. We have not put forward a strong and comprehensive vision and plan for public policy about how do we build prosperous communities right. where ordinary people benefit, <laughs> where communities build wealth. How do we do it? We have become too much the party on our heels, on the defensive, trying to stop the bleeding. We've got to stop that. We've got to be bold. We've got to be out there. And we're not going to do it just with words. I'm somebody who's good with words, but my words come from 30 plus years of experience and then hundreds upon hundreds of years of experience of people all over the 9th District, all over Virginia, all over Appalachia, and all over the United States of America who are, in fact, building much, much better alternatives, economies that work for people, their communities, and the ecosystem they depend on. That's happening all over this country, and that is the single biggest reason I'm running, because none of, not enough people know about it, and when we lift that up as a prime example that we can do better, that's what I think will begin to change the tide. Right. So, what am I running for? Well, you can go to our website, and at your tables, I passed out some little cards. We're going to have some, some better literature. We're in the process of making bumper stickers and all that. But if you go to the website, you can get the short version about my thinking, my plans for economic revitalization, for education, for many things. If you want the long version, buy my book, <laughs> which George was kind enough to just do when I walked in the door. But I'm running basically on a lot of different issues because being, a, and again, I'm I thought long and hard about this. When I jumped in in 2012, I took about 48 hours and talked to about four people. This time I took eight months and talked to scores of people before I decided. But one of the reasons I decided to run was, again, because I think the time is right. We'll come back to that. But when we talk about what I'm running for, I'm going to name four of the, of the big issues. First and foremost, kind of at the bottom of everything and what I know best, is this building an alternative economy, this economic revitalization. It's happening in small ways in almost every part of our district. It's just not enough of it. We're not investing in it. And this bottom-up, as I call it, this bottom-up economic development not only doesn't receive enough public and private investment, too often it's at a disadvantage when it comes to state and federal policy, and sometimes local policy. Too often we're giving $54 million to a chain retailer to come to the outskirts of a town while simultaneously giving little or nothing to the indigenous businesses, the manufacturers, and the retailers that are already there. Too often our public policy at all levels keeps this playing field very uneven and fundamentally I'm running to level that playing field and I think I have a few ideas about how to do that. In addition to this, this idea of leveling the playing field, the other thing is we've got to begin to truly invest in things. I just, I have a colleague, I'm, I'm lucky to have a number of colleagues who are national level thinkers and speakers. And one uh, is a remarkable woman named Marjorie Kelly, who writes a lot about worker ownership. <laughs> and she and her colleagues have just launched an initiative called 50 for 50. They want by 2050 to have 50 million Americans working in cooperatives and other worker owned enterprises. That's just one of the examples. We don't do much of that. We, we have a few co-ops, we have some consumer co-ops, 
some producer co-ops. We have very few worker co-ops in this country, relatively speaking. Co-ops are one of many emerging examples in which when you go that route, you get higher wages, much better retirements, sometimes, by some estimates, four times as much retirement at the same job as somebody in a traditional business. You get less environmental impact, you get more commitment to the community, you don't get the coming and going you get with big enterprises. So co-ops, community capital, like the Gates Center, like the, uh, the packing house we built in Duffield, Virginia, like so many other things, that's the kind of investment we need to do in order to enable small to mid-sized businesses to be elevated and grow. So fundamentally, again, I'm writing, writing on this idea of building strong economies at the local level. Because when you have healthy economies in which people can make a decent living and take care of themselves and not have chronic insecurity about where their next paycheck's coming from and not feel dehumanized by their work, you don't solve all our problems, but a whole lot of them start to get easier to manage. From the opioid crisis to health and health care issues to better education, strong, vibrant, diverse local economies we know from experience and we know from the research, they provide the foundation for healthy communities and healthy people. That's what I'm going to run on first and foremost. Thank you. Three other things, health and health care. So, you know, in the long run, and I hope it's not too much in the long run, I'm absolutely convinced that the only way we can make this work is with universal health care. Until we get there, and there's plans for a transition to it, where I would fight for, although it's a state-level rule, state-level policy, but I would fight for expanded Medicaid, no question about it. Fight for more investment in rural clinics, rural health clinics that do such an economical job of helping people help themselves, care for themselves. Bringing back and stabilizing our rural hospitals, which are in great need. And on the health side, recognizing that most of our healthcare system, whether it's publicly or privately owned, is about treating sickness. It's not about building health. How do I shut this damn thing off? <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> my wife Lori says, don't put me out in front of public. I'll say inappropriate things. And so I guess I gotta take that on myself. It's not as bad as our president. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. Very true. <laughs> but honestly, there's a lot of things we can do, and many, many decisions about health obviously come down to personal choices, family choices, community choices. But fundamentally, again, the federal government can do things to make it more likely that we build walkable, bikeable communities, that our downtowns are mixed use, so that we have people living where they shop and they work, so that people are in close proximity. And of course, as a farmer who's been involved in the local food movement, getting healthy local food into our schools, into our universities, and just into our neighborhood grocery stores. I know from experience that that's actually not as easy as it sounds. It's quite, quite challenging. But there's a number of things we can do, both investing and policy-wise, that can make us healthier. Because whether we have a public system or an insurance and pharmaceutical-dominated private system, it's going to get more and more expensive unless we are healthier. So that's my take there. Third thing is around the environment. I hope if you haven't already, you'll go to our website or you'll pick up a copy of the Rural Progressive Platform. I worked with Kathy Cole, with Eric, with Jan Ozer came in um, a little bit later, and Nancy Liebrich, and several other people from around the district. We started gathering in December after Trump's election to say, what can we put forward as a new way of thinking about some of the most difficult and divisive issues that we have? And that little four-page platform is our best shot at this point of naming new ways of talking about land and the environment, the economy and community. So what I'll say from that right now, because I'm really proud of that, and I'll also mention that five other congressional candidates, three from Virginia, one from upstate New York, and one from eastern Pennsylvania, are using our rural prog progressive platform in part in their run for Congress. <laughs> Things the rural platform does is it reframes the question of the environment. A lot of us, you know, there's this great irony we're at where areas like ours, where an awful lot of people are still very close to the land. Farmers, loggers, miners, and a lot of people who hunt and fish and then gather ginseng, and a lot of us who just maybe are a gener generation away from it. How did we get 
to the place where the communities that are most deeply intertwined with the land, with the ecosystem, are also the ones most likely to hate the EPA, hate environmentalists, hate the environmental movement. How do we get there? Well, again, there's plenty of fault on the side of the right-wing media, right-wing politics that have demonized environmentalists and others who are trying to preserve it. But it's also true, I believe, that as an environmental movement, we've too often put the ecosystem ahead of the people in the communities that live closest to it. And we don't need that trade-off to continue. We need to recognize that the environment, the ecosystem, wherever we are, whether we're in a forested land like our own, the flatlands of Kansas, fisheries, wherever it is, the environment fundamentally is the source of our wealth. It always has been, it always will be. And so, trying to do and what we've been trying to do through this world progressive platform is to rethink that and reframe it that we're talking about healthy environment and healthy livelihoods based on a healthy environment rather than just protecting the environment from people we're saying how do we create an environmental movement in which people thrive because of a healthy environment it's a, it's a new way of thinking about it and I'm going to push on that last thing I'll talk about uh, is education so my wife Lori was a school teacher one year in Detroit, she grew up in Michigan, uh, and 31 years in Washington County, Virginia, Greendale, and Hyder's Gap, and, and ended up in Abingdon, Virginia. And there's, you know, so much of education policy comes down to, and funding, comes down to the locality and the state. But the federal government can set direction. And let's be honest, through both Democratic and Republican administrations, there's been too much focus on testing, too much focus on a competitive winner-loser approach to this. What we need to do in education policy is, first of all, invest in it. Secondly, resist, resist, resist efforts at privatization. And third, put money and emphasis on experiential learning, learning with your hands, learning with your body, and creative learning, whatever the discipline, because we know that works better. We know it works better for at-risk kids and gifted kids. It works better for everybody. So let's invest in public education and let's free up our teachers to be able to move forward this kind of creative and experiential learning. Right. So, I'm one guy, one kind of little guy, <laughs> in a rural district, far away. It's the Republicans take it for granted. Too often the, the mainstream, the top of the Democratic Party in terms of the DNC and whatnot, uh, have sort of just given up on places like us. I need your help and the help of many of your friends and neighbors to change that. So let me give you the sort of nutshell of how I think we can win this election. Uh, first of all, the difference between now and 2012, I believe, is twofold. I mean, it's a lot of things, but two things fundamentally. One is that I'm entering 12 months ahead, not five months ahead. So I've got a lot more chance to do what I'm about to tell you we're going to try to do. Um, and secondly, when I ran in 2012, Mr. Griffith was a one-term congressman. It was not easy to make a case that he didn't do much because he hadn't been there very long. Well, now he's been there four terms, and he's demonstrated a tremendous commitment to doing very little. <laughs> he is at best, he's at best a minimalist when it comes to the role of government in our lives. I don't know if you know, but every year he sends back almost a fourth of the congressional office allocation that he gets. Congressional offices get about a million bucks a year, more or less, and that's how they hire staff and set up field offices in big districts, hold conferences and, and summits to move the ball forward on different issues. He sends a quarter of his budget back to save the taxpayer money, but what it translates to is less staff, less availability of his staff, and of course, with the rareness of his appearances, it all boils down to very little happens in this district. I think this is a more winnable election, in large part because now, after almost eight years, a whole lot of people, not just hardcore Democrats, believe that, they've seen it for themselves, or not seen it for themselves, as the case may be, and they're looking for a change. So I think those are two fundamental things. Yeah. Yeah. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, the fact of the matter is the two challenges we face. I've, I've been really lucky to talk to Rick Boucher a lot about this in terms of what he thought we needed to do to win. And it's pretty simple, but Rick's formula is we've got to totally energize our side, way beyond what you usually get in an off-year election. Totally. And especially young people who tend to either sit it out, or I know a whole bunch of 
entrepreneurial, gifted, uh, social justice motivated young people who've given up on the conventional political process. We've got to get them back in and get them excited. So that's half of it. It's getting that group of people. That's right. But the other half is we've got to reach people who are not Democrats. We did a phone poll and about a third of people identify as independents in our district. The truth is probably three-fourths of that third consistently have been voting Republican in the last few years. When I launched my campaign, I started in St. Paul, a little coal town, when I first moved when I came here. And then I went up to Christiansburg, and in St. Paul, the Republican mayor of the town, a Republican, me a Republican member of the Russell County Board of Supervisors were the two people that introduced me. That's because, not they love everything that I stand for, but because I've worked with them, their colleagues and their neighbors for many years, and they believe in the idea of somebody who understands the district and will work for positive change. So the second half of that, besides energizing our side, is, is me and my campaign and you reaching out to our neighbors, many of whom voted for Trump, many of whom didn't vote at all, but reaching out to them and persuading them that a farmer, small businessman has been working on economic development for 30 years could make a difference in this region. That's what we have to do. So as an example of that, we've done two things. Um, we, I've committed publicly to do a minimum of 100 community meetings or town halls between now and the election. And I think we'll do more, but I've committed to 100. And in, in those said, and I'm not talking primarily or, or certainly not exclusively about just meeting with a group of Dems. I'm talking about Rotary, Kiwanis, church clubs, women's groups, and just community gatherings. A hundred of those, it'll be a hundred times when I can sit down and listen to people's concerns, issues, and ideas, what they're doing to fix their own problems, and tell them a little bit about myself. I need your help setting up those meetings, at least four or five in Grayson County, four or five in Carroll County. I need your help getting in front of the non-choir part of our electorate. And also as a piece of that, we're committed to mobilizing 1,000 volunteers. Now that's about 40 or 50 per county. Now we'll probably have more up in Montgomery County and Bristol and some places where we have a few more people, a few, maybe fewer in some of the less populated. But what we're looking for here is not just to get people motivated next September to start knocking on doors, but to get people engaged now to start taking our little card around and saying a few words about this guy you heard talk. To start taking the better materials as we develop to get people to our website and Facebook page. By the way, we're doing a 90 second video, one a week. Uh, we've done three so far, we're gonna do them for the duration. And that's a fun little way to get people engaged on the issues and other things uh, where they may not engage on some written materials quite so much. But we need a thousand people and then we're looking for a core group in every county of a half a dozen or so people who will help us manage those other 40 or 50 or 100 volunteers in their community to start getting the word out now, to start getting people energized now. Because we're going to have a primary, as most of you know. Uh, we're going to have a primary this year rather than a convention. So rather than a guy like me having to go around and convince a handful of Democrats in each place, I've got to win the voters. And I think that's a good thing. It's more democratic. It's an opportunity for me to start talking about these issues. But it also means I'm going to have opponents. I already have one. We'll probably have a couple of more. So we need volunteers as soon as possible to begin engaging, begin talking about the issues, hopefully talking a little bit about this campaign. And then the last element connected to young people, we're hiring a young man, fabulous, fabulous young man named Jason Boncundra, who's going to be half time. His, his day job is running the farm that feeds into the Harvest Table restaurant in Medivine. Some of you might have been there. It's Stephen Hopp and Barbara Kingsolver's restaurant in Medivine. Jason runs that farm, that's his day job. But I managed to work out an agreement with his boss that we're going to have him for half time from starting this next week until farming season, basically the end of February, early March, to get out there and energize young people. And as part of that, we're going to have an extremely strong social media presence as well. So it's late. I've talked a while. But I want you to know that the, before I decided to do it, and it was a, it was a long and difficult decision-making process, Lori finally said to me, would you stop talking to people and just make a decision? So I did. And then she said, oh, God. <laughs> In any event, I want you to know that a big part of the decision this time was whether or not I could win. Because when I ran in 2012, honestly, I knew I didn't have a chance. I knew it. 
and I entered to try to put a different voice into the debate. I wouldn't have done it this time if I thought I couldn't win. I think I can, but only if practically everybody in this room and most of your friends and neighbors become a part of this campaign. That's how we're going to do it. Thanks so much.